Satnam Yogi San Yoginis. Hello, hello. This is the next part in this mantra course. Uh, the last, uh, the last session we were talking about the similarities and difference between Om and Ong and how to chant it. I'm recording this back to back. Actually, uh, I just recorded the other video, but I'm putting them separately so that uh, they are slightly shorter and easier for people to to um, watch these videos because everybody has busy lives. So. Uh, what we're going to see today is a possible origin, origin for the Ekonkar. And uh, we already talked about how Ong is connected to Om through the rules of grammar of Sanskrit, how Om followed by another sound, it becomes very nasal and contracted, and that can create a G sound. And we're going to see today uh, something a bit, a bit more specifically about Ekonkar, how does that come from, from here. So we were seeing these, uh, these diagrams yesterday. We were continuing with the same page. I don't want to put a new page yet, uh, but um, exploring this OM turning into ONG. We were talking about the symbol of OM and how it comes from uh, A, U and M. And something I didn't mention is about uh, the names of OM. Some other, NOM has other, sorry. Om, <laughs> Om has other names as well. You will find that uh, sometimes it is called the Pranava. Yeah, and this is the like prim primeval sound. Primeval sound is it called? Or primal sound, like very very like the original sound, the first of all sounds. And another way of calling the Om, this is about the Om, eh? another way of calling it, it's this Omkara. This is another term that we use to talk about Om. Uh, and literally, Kara, Kara, Kara is creation, yeah? Cre the word create comes from Kara. The word in English create comes from Kara. So this literally what it means is uh, Om Maker. So it's talking about the first uh, source of these creative sounds or the act of creation. So Omkara, Omkara is the act of creation. Now I'm going to talk today about this Ekonkar and here we can already see how this Om followed by another sound becomes this Ong this uh, nasalization of the sound that becomes like a G. So this would be Onkara, Onkara. So here we already have this Onkara that um, we will find later in the appearance of the Mul Mantra by Guru Nanak when he starts with Ek Onkar, Satnam, Karta, Puraka. So Ek Onkar, Onkar would be this Onkara. And Ek means one. So there's one, there's one Om maker, there's one creation of the universe, there's one explosive sound that creates the whole universe. So this is, um, very, very shortly, this is basically the connection to Ekonkar, but I want to go into much greater depth because um, there is something extremely interesting in, um, in the symbols as well and the sounds. And in order to talk about that, <clears throat> I'm going to share some research I have been doing, exploring, uh, there is a, an, a, a journal, pub, uh, sorry, um, publication in a journal. Uh, it's called the on, the Sharada, on the Sharada Alphabet by George Grierson. This is um, the journal of the Royal Ascetic uh, Society. This is 1916. <laughs> so this is a, a paper written a hundred years ago, over a hundred years ago about some texts over a thousand years ago. So this is quite old, yeah? But it is very revealing. And um, I, I, I like to read things from the past and see how they are relevant to today. And in this particular uh, paper is very, very interesting. It's filled with stuff that is very relevant to us. So let me share that with you. It's, called the, it's based on the grammar of the Kashmir language. Kashmir is the region of the, uh, close to the north of India, right? Touching the north of India. And, uh, and he talks about 
this Sharada alphabet, this paper is on the Sharada alphabet. This Sharada alphabet is based on the same system as that of the Nagari alphabet. Now, the Nagari alphabet, this is the ancestor of the Devanag Devanagari. Now, <coughs> I used to pronounce it always Devanagari. Now I, I realize it's Devanagari. So Devanagari is the script with which Sanskrit is written. Sanskrit is the language, the alphabet is Devanagari. Now Nev Devanagari, the, the precursor to this one, the ancestor to this one is Nagari. And, and the Sarada alphabet is the same system as this one. It talks about how it's mostly related to the Takri alphabet on the Punjab hills and to the Langda or clipped alphabet of the Punjab and through them to the Gurumukhi alphabet. But unlike them, unlike Nagari, it puts the letter Sanha at the end of the alphabet and not after the vowels. So here we already see this connection with Gurumukhi and we see that Gurumukhi does not necessarily come out of Sanskrit. It's not like a derivation of Sanskrit. It's not like Sanskrit what evolved into Gurumukhi, but it's more like a parallel um, um, language or script. At least the script is definitely parallel in the same area, and they all influenced each other. Yeah? But we wouldn't know how which one is older necessarily. However, the Sharada alphabet is really... The, the, based on this Nagari, which is the before Devanagari. Now, the words are very interesting. Devanagari, I find it a very interesting word because... Uh, let's take a look at it. Sorry, the Nagari, yeah? So, Devanagari, it's, uh, it's two sounds. Deva, Nagari, two, two words. And Deva means... Remember, this is the, the, the alphabet of Sanskrit, yeah? Deva means something heavenly. And Nagari, if you look in the Wikipedia or some dictionaries, it would, talk, it would say Nagari comes from Nagaram, which is a town. Some sort of saying like it belongs to a town. So meaning that this is the kind of language that you would speak in a town. And it's a heavenly language to speak among ourselves. So that's kind of like the original translation. translation. But I... I, I I, I haven't found it anywhere, but I find something very interesting. Nagari has a connection to Naga. And Naga were divine beings who were, or semi-divine beings, who were half people, half human, half serpent. Now, Deva, divine, Nagari, this divine Naga being the divine beings, could it be that the name of the alphabet, actually more than saying this is the alphabet for the townspeople, it's actually the alphabet for the serpent? Now we know about the serpent being the Kundalini and how the Kundalini, um, as it awakens, it enlightens us and it is through the power of sound and Shabbat and mantra chanting and chanting the Nam that we can get liberated. So could it be that the origin of the alphabet is actually more about awakening the Kundalini more than actually create a language for the townspeople to be able to talk? This is my suggestion, and uh, I find it uh, an interesting uh, connection there, so I just wanted to share it. So let's, let's carry on with this, uh, this uh, paper. It says that um, when this alphabet is written down, it is usually preceded by an invocation. It's Om Namah Siddham. And in Kashmir, uh, they say Om Swasti Ekam Siddham. Yeah? Now it it is like as like something to 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 exalt what is what is to come and to give power to it. Now these words is this is this is the interesting thing because there is actual symbols for every one of these words in the incantation like Om, Vasti, and Siddham, but the word Ekam is not written with these symbols but actually has a different mystic sound, which is like this. Very interesting. So the whole, the whole incantation or the whole mantra would be written with the original sounds, but this symbol is different. Now, why do I find this interesting? Because when we are looking at the Mul Mantra, for example, Ekonkar, Satanam, Kartapurak, Nirbao, all the words, Satnam, Kartapurak, Nirvao, they are written in, in Gurmukhi with the symbols, 
but Ekonkar has its sound specific symbol, mystic symbol, and it's only used like that, Ekonkar. It is not used in a different way. And, and that's very significant. That's one aspect that is significant. Let's, let's carry on. So this symbol is different from the others, and, and it is called Ok Som Gor, but it is read as Ekam. Now, or, or, or already Ekam, we can see this Ekam linked to the Ekonkar, yeah, because Ek means one. So that, that's already interesting. Now, he goes on to say that uh, the traditional explanation is in order to master the theory of mantras in the Kashmir Shaivism, it is necessary to learn the meaning of power of each letter composing a mantra or the mantra chakra. Yeah, as, it, as if the mantras have chakras, every chakra is the letter, and we need to understand the, every letter to extract the power from it. That's what we are doing in this course, yeah? going through every letter, vowel, semi-vowel, consonants, and extracting the power of each one of these sounds. So he goes on to say that the vowels represent the various shaktis, and the 25 consonant, consonants are the 25 uh, tattvas, and the others are the higher tattvas. So, the vowels are the shaktis, and the consonants are the tattvas. Okay. So let's look at this, uh, this symbol. It has three parts. There's the horizontal line on top, that's the letter A, and it represents Shiva. And the other perpendicular strokes represent the other vowels. So A, E, E, U, U, E, I, O, A, O, M, A. All the other vowels would be this, except the A, which is the, the line that is at the very top of the word. So because the vowels are the shaktis, this would be the shakti. You remember there is this polarity between Shiva and Shakti. Shiva is the masculine principle and Shakti is the feminine principle or the power. And so Shiva would be the A, ah, the Shaktis are the others. And then the other two signs, the other two symbols, is like a plow, hala. You know, like in the, the posture, halasana, yeah, the plow pose. And is represented like this, yeah, the body is in this posture. So hala is a plow, but it's it means all the consonants because the grammarians call the consonants hal. So the whole sign actually represents all the vowels plus the consonants, so the entire alphabet. Yeah? On the mystical meaning, Shiva plus all the shaktis and the tattvas, because the consonants mean the tattvas. So if, if you look at the, the, the cosmic manifestation chart, we can see how there is, there is the, the one and manifested God becomes, um, is Purusha, yeah, the spirit, the, the spirit turns into matter. Purusha becomes Prakriti, kind of, Prakriti is the derivation of Purusha, it's the manifestation of it. And Prakriti, in order for us to perceive that, then it becomes something that we can see, we can hear, we can smell, we can, with our five senses, and that's the five, five tattvas, yeah? So it manifests into the tattvas, and then we can perceive it through our five senses. So this is the representation of the of all the sounds is right there. So Shiva plus all the saktis and tattvas and all his developments in the way of so-called creation. Now creation is kar, remember. So we are saying that this symbol is called it's called ekam, and it represents the whole ek on yeah is like the one from which everything comes all this om sound and then that from that there is the whole of creation yeah so ekon kar i believe there is a very strong link here so he goes into detail okum means one uh, sam means the supreme experience and guru it has been inquired and therefore can be understood so this mark is one of the sacred symbols used at the commencement or end of any important writing. Yeah? So this was, for example, in, one, in a little... Um, uh, sorry, how was that? This was in, um, in one of the... Um, a grammar text. 
Was it the most popular handbook in northern India and the Buddhist regions of Central Asia over a thousand years ago? There was this grammar, and the first sutra would be this one, and it would be talking about this. So this and this symbol, it was a sacred symbol used in the commencement or end of any important writing. Now, that's very interesting as well because we have a symbol that is different, written differently than the rest of the script and is utilized at the beginning of very important writings. And this symbol meaning, it, it would be called Ekam, and it's talking about the creation. Yeah, the powers of Shiva and Shakti and the creation that comes from it. Well, that's Ekonkar. And Ekonkar is the very beginning of the, of the Sri Guru Granth Sahib. If you look at the, face, the first page, we will find Ekonkar. This is Ekonkar Sagur Prasad in many, many of the Shabbats. And it's Ekonkar Satnam Kartapurak with the Mul Mantra in the very first beginning of the whole book and the beginning of Jabzi, no? So that's, to me, that's a very strong link that um, makes me believe that, you know, if, if over a thousand years ago they had these popular books, these grammar books, and they... Uh, many of the sacred texts were written with this original symbol and the Gurus being as, as, uh, as wise as they were and as knowledgeable as they were, it is likely to, we could assume that there is, they know or they heard or they, they have a connection to this, um, this symbol and this beginning with this Ekam and Ekonkar. Yeah? So it makes sense to me that it, it, it would evolve into Ekonkar as uh, Guru Nanak would uh, later um, put it in the Mul Mantra. So that's a very interesting link. Now, uh, in the very same paper, if we carry on a little bit more, there is another, in another part of the paper, there is another su super interesting thing, which is, from Bindu emerges the Pranava, and from the letter, the letters. Now, if you remember, I said this is the this is the symbol of the Om. Pranava is this name of for the Om, the primeval sound. Now Om sometimes you may find it also written like this, which is like um, even more contraction of the sound. You know, do you remember that this Om is A U M, like the cursive of these three sounds becomes like this. But this we find this symbol as well sometimes. And it, when it's written like this, it, it actually means from Bindu and Chandra comes this Om. So it's connected to the Bindu and the Chandra. Now, what is this saying? From the Bindu emerges the Pranava, the Om. And from the Om come the letters. I mean, look at this. No? From the Om comes all the manifestation in the body. And as they come into the body, it becomes these vicious sounds. And then from every sound in every one of these chakras, then it will become the different consonants, which we will see in the following videos. Yeah. So there is, there is this OM, as it comes into our body, becomes the different sounds. And it's like uh, HUM, YAM. Yeah? And as we go into every one of these sounds, then it explodes into the different vibrations in that chakra if you see we will see in the following videos every chakra has different vibrations around it and they that's the the next manifestation that's the consonants so let's carry on from the bindu emerges the pranava and from the latter the letters of which the consonants are lifeless bodies and the vowels their life you remember the, the vowels were the life givers, the matricas? The combinations thereof form 81 words. Isn't that interesting? Why 81? Hmm. Could it be that these 81 words are connected to the 81 facets of the mind? Yeah. Three aspects of the personal mind, negative, positive, neutral, three aspects of the functional mind, <clears throat> mana, buddhi, hankar. And then we have nine aspects, 27 projections, 81 facets. Could it be that these 81 words have a connection to the 81 facets? Could it be that this is where Yogi Bhajan found the inspiration to talk about that? Because I haven't found anywhere else. If anybody has found these 81 facets in any 
uh, original uh, Text, Sanskrit text. Uh, I would be very, very interested to to find to to hear about this. Also, the negative, positive, and neutral. That is something that uh, I still haven't found in any Sanskrit literature. I have found some connections, but not a hundred percent. We will talk about this in some other video, <laughs> as usual. <laughs> okay, so let's go back here. So he, he comes back to this topic of these three sounds, ek, som, gor, how similar gor is to kar, by the way, and, and the sign. And he's saying that this is Shiva transcending the kula. Now, kula, he, he defines here kula is like jiva, the soul, prakriti, the primal matter, space and time, and the five tadvas, ether, earth, water, fire, and air. Interesting that the space and time is, is written here. I don't know if it's something from the Sanskrit text, or this is something from the author of this uh, paper, because let's remember this um, paper was published in 1916, very little after uh, Einstein would be publishing his ideas on the space-time continuum. So uh, to me, it just suggests that the author of this book, of this uh, paper was, um, you know, in those circles, they were meditating upon the space and time and ether. Einstein would talk about ether as well, even though different concept. But yeah, it would be very interesting. So here we have again this ok, which is the ek of ekonkar, being one absolute secondless, so there is no second. And then sama would be the principle of consciousness, and then goro would be non my intuition of the ego. I don't think when he says ego ki, I don't think he means our ego. Being in capital letters, I think he means his our identity, our, our personal identity would be more like the satnam. It begins with a and ends with ha. A contains the whole of the universe. So that is the creation. That would be the kar. And then he goes on to carries on and mentions a, a little poem. It's very, very interesting. And how this poem, when you decode the poem, what it says, is talking about the murmuring or the buzzing. So when you make a noise from her place, the hala, uh, the power of the upward breath, the power of the upward breath, shattering in her condition, the bonds and circles. So a breath that is shattering the bonds, that would be the grantis, and circles would be the chakras, opening a passage for herself to rise aloft, shall reveal herself. So he, he clarifies that this refers to the tantric notion, which identifies Shakti with the Kundalini force, resting coiled around the lingam in the muladhara of the microcosm. So it's saying like when we are chanting mantras, the upward breath of the vibration is awakening the Kundalini, breaking through the grantis, opening these chakras, and um, opening a passage for herself to rise aloft, to get to the higher, the tenth gate, and finding illumination. So that's um, very, very interesting. And I think that's, that's enough. Uh, the, this... this um, paper. Also, uh, there is uh, some details on some of the sounds, particularly on the vowels, and associate some particular specific um, qualities to the vowels. So the E is the quality of will, and the U has the, 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 the power of thought. So there is different qualities that he gives to every one of these sounds according to the Shiva Sutras. But this is like... Um, going down deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole, yeah? There is a lot of research, there is a lot of documents, there's a lot of papers, a lot of very old Sanskrit texts talking about meaning of powers, uh, meaning and power of different sounds. And uh, it would take um, many years to research this. And <clears throat> I just wanted to point out, I like to do this research and share it with you so you don't have to be going around exploring all these things. I'm, but uh, if anybody wants to go and find these documents, I'll put the link in the, in the comments below <clears throat> and read it for yourself and explore it, investigate, and then share with us what you get out of it. At some point, it's enough theory. At some point, you have to say, okay, enough. I, I've seen it clearly. There's a connection to this. There's a connection with the Konkar and Om. There's a connection with the Kundalini. And therefore, let's just go and practice, yeah? 
why talk more about mantras when we can be chanting mantras? So <laughs> that's a little bit the paradox of this course that we, we, I want to explore the theory and the aspects behind, but I also want to chant. Yeah. And, um, but chant would be nicer if we were doing, doing that live in person. Yeah. I would be chanting with you rather than me here presenting like a video. Uh, but anyway, so at some point we will stop with theory and we'll just go more into the chanting. But so far we covered the um, um, difference between Om and Ong and how Ong could originate and Ekonkar. And we have done the vowels and the semi-vowels. So next videos we will, we're going to start going into the consonants, which is very interesting, going into the upper palate and exploring the little points, the meridians, which are stimulated through the touching of the tongue in the upper palate. So that's the most fascinating aspects of Nat Yoga and that's coming up in the following uh, sessions. So hopefully you will be with us and uh, you are inspired to continue with this. As usual, thank you for being here and like, comment and subscribe and see you in the next video. Sanam.